All right, well, we should get started because we have a lot to cover, and um, I've been very excited about getting into this these subjects of the lost books of the Bible, the banned books of the Bible, the spooky, whispery, secret books of the Bible, because these are used so often on documentaries, on the History Channel, Discovery Channel, PBS, BBC, all of the above, to attack a person's faith or trust or sense of the reliability of the of the scriptures and when you get some more knowledge about it it just dispels all of the hokey spooky music documentary stuff that often we see um, so we're going to talk today about popular but non-canonical books then we're going to talk about heretical books from the early church periods and these are the books that oftentimes um, well, some of these books, we have people suggesting they belong in the Bible, but they were kept out, they were blocked out, they were kicked out. Now, we've sort of ruled that out from last week. Last week, we talked about how we got our canon of scripture. This week, I just want you to be familiar with these books because a, knowledge is power. And a little bit of knowledge here will really empower you in a good way. So let's, let's just get started. We'll get right into it. We're going to quote from the text themselves in a lot of cases and look at what they are. Um, the first one on our list of here, we're going to start with popular books that were popular in the early church, but they were not canonical. They were not part of the scriptures. And the first one we'll look at is First Clement. First Clement is an important work. We learn some things from it because he's quoting from scriptures and things like that. It was written from the church in Rome to the church in in um, uh, in Corinth, I blank for a second there, and the church in Corinth. The reason why is they were going through something of a church split. Um, they had kicked their elders out. The young and the, the the people in in Corinth, the younger ones in particular, had kicked the elders out. So we don't want you. They wanted to do their own thing. It was just a time of rebellion, and it was very unfortunate. And so this rather long letter takes about I don't know about an hour and twenty minutes to read through the whole thing, and it's. It's basically encouraging them to submit to the elders and submit to their leaders and that sort of thing. Um, that was why it was written. Now, there's a there's a couple important things about this, but now this letter is not really important in regarding did it belong in the Bible? Uh, no, it really didn't belong in the Bible. That it was popular because it's got a lot of really good content. It quotes a lot from other scriptures. It talks a lot about Paul and how he wrote to Corinth before, and it reiterates some things that he had said. But where it becomes important is in discussions with Catholic apologists who often, oftentimes uh, Catholic apologists, they think that church history belongs to the Catholic church. But when you look into the quotes more carefully, you find that it, that's not really the case. Um, First Clement is one of those because they say it was written by Clement who was a pope in Rome. Well, First Clement doesn't say anything about a papacy, doesn't say anything about him being the pope, that sort of thing. Um, apparently there was a plurality of elders not a pope and priests and cardinals. Those are not mentioned. There was just a plurality of eldership, just as what we read about in the pastoral epistles, that sort of thing that was going on. And there was also a plurality of elders in Rome based on this letter as well. So it actually moves away from the idea of a monarchical episcopate. There's a fancy term for you. But anyway, the skeptics aren't interested in this book, First Clement. It was very popular in the early church. They're not interested in it. Why? Why do you suppose they're not interested in this? Because it contains no heresy. Because if they want to shove a book into the Bible, they want it to have heresy. Because really, ultimately, it's just an attack on Scripture. It's a biased um, worldview assault on the Bible, where they're trying to find books to put in there that would make, make Christians freak out <laughs> and make unbelievers feel better about their unbelief. Then there's a book called the Didache. The Didache was a teaching type book. Um, now, this book was written about 180, r around that time, 180. So we're very early, very, very early material. We didn't have this kind of stuff available to us, th a lot of these books, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but now we do because we've been digging and collecting. And there's, you know, uh, paleog uh, paleographers that, like, gather this stuff and a bunch of papyrologists and all fancy terms that basically they, they correlate these things. Now, this book, the Didache, is presented in a BBC documentary as the secret book of true Christianity that reveals a different Jesus. Oh my. Um, all you have to honestly do is read the Didache. 
just read through it to see that this is not the case. But let me tell you some of the claims they make in this in this documentary. They say that the they, he he travels into Jerusalem into 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 where he meets the uh, the, the patriarch there, one of the patriarchs of one of the churches there, and and he says, "I am here going to look at the only copy of the Didache." And the implication is that the whole world doesn't really know about this book. We've actually had it since like 1883. We've been aware of the Didache. We've been reading it. You could Google it online. People literally have made audio files free on YouTube. You could just listen to the thing. It's fairly short. It's a great read, actually. He says it may predate the Gospels in this BBC documentary. It may predate the Gospels. It quotes the Gospels. Like that, I mean, talk about some psychic powers going on right there in the Didache. Like you're going to predate books you quote? I don't think so. And the Gospels definitely don't quote the Didache. It's the other way around. And no scholar thinks it predates the Gospels. This is just lying because he has an agenda, this particular docu documenter. It says that it is, and quote, one of the most contested early Christian documents. No, it's not. It's just a lie. This BBC documentary is just completely lying. It's not contested by anybody. No, there's no, there's no contestations or whatever the term would be over this book. Nobody cares. This is a good example of non-scholarship being presented as scholarship because the, the, the people making the video realize that the majority of their listeners are ignorant about these issues and they'll take their word as if it's gold. It says, and here's the attack. It says, in the Didache, there is no mention of the virgin birth, of the resurrection of Jesus, or no mention of Jesus as God. Now that's sort of true. Sort of true. Uh, it, it's consistent with the type of treatment of Christ that you get throughout all of church history. He is Lord. He is God. But it doesn't make that statement, Jesus is God. But here's the issue. It doesn't deny those things either. It doesn't deny the virgin birth. It doesn't mention the virgin birth. So he goes, it doesn't declare. You know what I mean? It's, it's like this, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. And that's what the skeptics are good at nowadays. The scholarlish skeptics are good at making mountains out of molehills. And when you get a little more information, it really helps you out. Does every text that Christians write have to rehash every doctrine of Christianity? No, of course not. Uh, we don't need to see the virgin birth in every single text. We just want to see that it's consistent where it is and it's not denied in the others. Another issue is this is after the Gospels. So if you're going to tell me the early church didn't have a belief in the virgin birth, then why is it in the Gospels which predate the Didache? It's, it's just kind of an ignorant sort of version of scholarship. The Didache itself, what is it really? It was like a new believers packet. There was Gentile or uh, pagan converts to, to Christianity. And the Didache was like a teaching script to go through with these new converts to educate them in the basics of Christianity. It was like a new believers class. That's what the Didache was. It's very short. It's instructions for godliness mostly. This is why there isn't as much theology in there because it was primarily focused on the idea of how to live as a Christian. I'll give you some of the things that it talks about. It mentions baptism. That would be important for a new believer. It talks about baptism. It says that they should baptize by immersion if at all possible. But if there isn't enough water for some reason, then they, then they use what they've got. So the preferred method was immersion. That's interesting, back in 100 AD. And it mentions the Trinitarian formula specifically. It says to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that's right out of Matthew. And that's the Trinitarian formula because there's one name, but there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have three in one. And I, I think that's pretty neat. It also mentions a lot about traveling preachers and prophets. Apparently, this was an issue back then. And it says a few things. It says, if, if, if a prophet is speaking in the spirit and tells you to prepare food, he's not allowed to eat it. If he eats the food he tells you to prepare, he's a false prophet. This is what it says. It says, if a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord that you're supposed to give him money, he is a false prophet. TBN. <laughs> Right, right? <laughs> it says that these prophets, these traveling preachers, they can only stay for a day or two, three at the most. After that, if they try to stick around, they're a false prophet. Obviously, there were fake prophets who were just moochers in the name of the Lord trying to get money from the body of Christ, and this was trying to protect the body from these people. You know. Um, now, however, if you had like a, a local pastor, he could obviously stay longer than three days. We're talking about the traveling people. That's different. 
It also specifically mentions abortion. And it says, and I'll quote, do not murder a child by abortion or kill a newborn infant. And this is told because they realize that these pagan converts may have had ungodly ways of thinking and, and brought ungodly moralities into Christianity, not realizing it. So they wanted to make sure that they got this really clear on this issue. And may I, may I repeat, this is good advice. Abortion is murder. Anybody who says otherwise is denying the facts. This is just utter folly. Um, and the church wide, I mean, what the church, early church did was they would go around. When the Romans would leave their babies out overnight exposed and the dogs in Rome would come and kill and mangle and eat these little babies because that was their form of abortion, the early church would comb the streets, picking up these children and adopting them as their own. And I go, that's our, that's our family right there, you guys. That's what we do. That's what we do. And so, praise the Lord for that. Um, the next book we'll look at is The Shepherd of Hermas. And we'll do a lot of quotes, but that'll be later when we get to the more interesting stuff. The Shepherd of Hermas was written by a brother of one of the elders in Rome. And he, it was written about 140, 140 AD. Now, it had some, some tout because it was, he was a relative of one of the elders. Um, the Miratorian Fragment, we talked about this last week, that was the earliest canon list we have. And it excludes the Shepherd of Hermas. And it says, because it was written in our time. So the Shepherd of Hermas became popular for a season, but it, was never, it wasn't considered canon by the whole church at any point. And those closest to it at its writing said, no, this, is, this was written in our time. We know who wrote it. it wasn't, it's not apostolic. But this was a, was a more popular book. It's not really theological, so you can't really look into it for a lot of theology. It's a series of visions, several visions that this, this guy has. Um, and he sees at one point, he sees a shepherd. And that's why they call it the Shepherd of Hermas. His name is Hermas. And he sees also a woman. He sees her when she's young. He sees her when she's old. And she represents the church. And it's, it's, it's a little weird, to be honest. It's a little strange to read and to listen to. It's just kind of odd. But it's not really very theological. There, then after the visions, there's parables and then ethical instructions. And I think the person this book would encourage the most is a man who had an ungodly wife and ungodly children. Because it, that's, that's the situation of the, of the guy that writes it. And so he's, he's being told that he has to go and rebuke his children and rebuke his wife and stuff like that. And I, I think it may have been a little self-comfort going on <laughs> there. We'll see. Who knows? Um, then there's... Now, these are not canon, right? These are not scripture. They're just things that are leftovers from the early church. Imagine if you went to a modern-day um, uh, Christian bookstore. But it was a thousand years from now, and so you're digging into, you're like, a thousand years ago, Christianity looked like this, and you picked random books out of the bookstore. You'd be getting a mixed bag, wouldn't you? You'd have some really good solid stuff, and you'd have some stuff that was like, they what? They believed this? And then if they could interview us, we'd be like, real Christians don't believe that garbage, man. That's just, that's just for money. They just sell that. That's just, you know, we're like, look at our bookstore. It's smaller for a reason. <laughs> So then we have um, the letter of Polycarp to Philippi. The letter of Polycarp, we talked about him last week a little bit. It's 14 chapters, um, which is actually, it's not very long. Each chapter is generally about two to three verses long. So it's actually very short. Um, it's very good instructions. Again, it's another moral letter. It's not theological. It quotes the Gospels. It quotes Paul. Um, I noticed just reading through it, I noticed quotes from Galatians, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians that I just casually noticed as I was reading through. It talks a lot about Paul, and I'll quote to you one of the things Polycarp says about Paul. In Polycarp, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, there's only one other verse in that chapter. <laughs> it says this, These things, brethren, I write unto you concerning righteousness, not because I laid this charge upon myself, but because you invited me. For neither am I, nor is any other like unto me, able to follow the wisdom of the blessed and glorious Paul, who when he came among you, taught face to face with the men of that day, the word which concern, I'm trying to take the eth, the concerneth truth carefully and surely, I was trying to take those, those words out, the yees and stuff, who also, when he was absent, wrote a letter unto you, into which if you look diligently, you will be able to, to be built up unto the faith given to you. So what does he say? I'm writing you a letter because you asked me to write to you. So here, here's the letter I'm sending. But I'm inferior to Paul. Again, good letter, good work, not scripture. Not even thought to be scripture by the author of it. So these are the types of things. Now, none of these are apostolic. 
None of them are affirmed by a large group of the church at any point in time. Um, if, but if you wanted to try to add to the New Testament, these are, your, these are the ones you could pick from. Why? Because, well, they really are popular church works. So if you were going to try to add, these are your best candidates. But the skeptics tip their hat. You know why? Because they're not interested in those books, are they? No, 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 no. They don't want that. They want heresy. They want to twist Christianity. They want to attack and change Christianity. Say that your Christianity is just like your new fake version of Christianity, but, but really in the beginning it was this and that. Um, so modern day popular alternate canon books that skeptics like to bring up, that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time. And that, that's just what I've been excited to get into because these things are just weird. And it's neat to know and it totally disarms the enemy when you're aware of these things. So these fall into the category of not disputed books, questionable books. These fall into the category of rejected books by the church. Often they're heretical books that the church was like, whoa, what is that doing? Don't read that. Don't, don't share that. That's wrong. That's, that's a bad book. That is just a bad book. Um, modern day example might be, um, oh gosh, what was the recent book, fairly recent that was written about how you could you basically just be super selfish and then think about all the things you want and they'll just magically come to you. What was that book? The, um, the Secret. Thank you. It was The Secret. The Secret. Which just preaches narcissism. It's really weird. Um, look into that sometime. Now, if someone saw that and said, oh, that's Christianity, which of course they'll, because the author of every wacky book out there in the world says they're Christian. But we all know that's a lie. So... The Gospel of Thomas. Let's look at the Gospel of Thomas. This, this book, probably the most popular of all of the ones we'll go over as far as not amongst Christians, but amongst non-Christians who want Christians to like this book. <laughs> it's interesting. The Jesus Seminar, which was a group of scholars a little bit back in the day, but these guys who were part of the seminar, they have become the regular guys that get interviewed whenever the History Channel, these guys do their, their, their documentaries. These are the guys they interview, people from the Jesus Seminar. They're all um, liberal, either either Christian liberal scholars or completely non-Christian scholars. Like they have other beliefs, agnostic, atheist, or they believe in sort of their own made-up religions. That's interesting to look at. The beliefs of the Jesus Seminar people is a whole interesting study. So they pretty much canonized the Gospel of Thomas. What they did was they had a gathering where they decided to, with little colored beads, vote on all the things in the Bible of the New Testament, specifically the Gospels, did Jesus really say this? Did he maybe say this? Does the idea of this traces back to Jesus, but not the words? Did he probably not? No, he definitely didn't say this. And they voted with little colored beads on which pieces of the Bible Jesus actually said. The Gospel of Thomas, they said that this text had more authentic sayings of Jesus than the Gospel of John that we find in our New Testament. Now, there's lots of work out there to debunk their hokey stuff. Uh, what made it powerful was that Robert Funk, the guy that gathered the Jesus Seminar together, he got like 80 scholars who were all liberals, and he got them all together at the same time. So that then whoever dis disagreed with him, he's like, but I have 80 scholars. Do you have 80 scholars? And um, so the equivalent would be if we had 80 Christian or conservative scholars get together, and then we, could, we have 80 scholars, and we could, we could argue about how many people we have on our side. Because that's really really effective. So um, the Gospel of Thomas is a mid-2nd century work. So 150 or later, that's probably when it was written. There is one copy in existence of the Gospel of Thomas. There's only one copy that exists. Obviously, this is not a hugely popular work in the Christian church. We'll talk later about how many copies of our biblical books exist, which is quite a few, quite a few. Um, it claims to have been written by the Apostle Thomas. It was written in about 150. It claims to have been written by the Apostle Thomas, who was walking with Jesus back in 30. It was written in 150. So obviously it's a forgery or a miracle, one or the other. <laughs> one or the other. Um, this automatically disqualifies it from being some kind of Christian text. It's a forgery. There's only 114 verses in the entire thing. It's actually fairly short. There's a great video on YouTube of a, of a wide-eyed, spooky-looking Jesus reading, Jesus guy, you know, reading this text, and it's, this, it's the creepiest thing you've ever seen. But I recommend checking it out. Because <laughs> you're, you're like, what is this? 
there's only 114 verses and all of them are sayings of Jesus. There's no storyline. It's just sayings. Just Jesus said this, Jesus said this. Sometimes it's like the disciples asked him and Jesus said, and he says this. But it's just sayings of Jesus or often close to a saying of Jesus. And then most of the time, a fabricated thing Jesus most assuredly never said. Let me give you an example of a close to a saying of Jesus. Saying 71 says in the Gospel of Thomas, I shall destroy this house and no one shall be, shall be able to rebuild it. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that that's not quite right. He said, destroy this house and I will rebuild it in three days. But, but the Gospel of Thomas version is, I shall destroy this house because in, it, it's a Gnostic type gospel, which is a belief that the body is bad, but the spirit is good. And so he wants to destroy this house and get rid of it forever. No, no resurrection, no physical, anything. Physical is bad. It's called dualism. The, uh, that's the religion, the offshoot from Christianity that believes in this, this type of thing. There's actually a Gnostic church in LA, believe it or not, a big one. Um, so Gnosticism is still alive today. Um, so let me read to you some of the sayings. Here's some of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas. Ask, uh, this is the one that they basically, the Jesus Seminar canonized this book for themselves. If the flesh came into being because of the spirit, that is a marvel. But if spirit came into being because of body, that is a marvel of marvels. Yet I marvel at how this great wealth has come to dwell in this poverty. Let me go on. That was number 29. Saying number seven is, Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat so that the lion becomes human. And foul is the human that the lion will eat and the lion still will become human. <laughs> Wretched is the body, is a body that is dependent on a body. And wretched is the soul that is dependent on these two. It sounds just like Jesus. I mean, it's like right, right out of the pages of scripture. So again, Gnosticism is this idea. I'll give you, there's a, I can give a huge explanation about ions and pleroma and all this great stuff. Here's the bottom line. Gnosticism believed, and a lot of these gospels that they like are Gnostic. They're works of basically a cult that adopts the name Christian but is obviously not Christian at all. They believe that the God of the Old Testament was an evil God called the Demiurge. That the real ultimate creator of all things was a distant God you could never know. Way, way out there. And that this thing created um, sometimes not, well, I think the standard Gnosticism belief is that this thing created emanations unintentionally of other beings and those beings created other things and those created other things. Eventually you have a being that's so far from the original maker that it's just, it's, it's icky and it's gross and it's bad and it's evil. That's the God of the old Testament. And that this God then creates earth and, and all this stuff that we see, but all this is evil and bad. And Jesus comes to help show us we can be delivered from these things. So, I mean, obviously this cannot be Christianity. Obviously this is not a Jewish, Messiah belief system. This is a, a weird thing. Let me read to you a, a few more. Um, here's saying number 30. Where there are three deities, they are divine. Where there are two or one, I am with that one. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> when you see one who is not born of woman, fall on your faces in worship. That one is your father. Whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I, my, I myself shall become that person and the hidden things will be revealed to him. The last saying in the Gospel of Thomas, saying 114, is probably the, mo the most famous one. I'll read it to you here. It says, Simon Peter said to them, Make Mary leave us, for females don't deserve life. Jesus said, here's his solution to that problem. Look, I will guide her to become male so that she too may become a living spirit to resemble you males. She's not a living spirit now. For every female who makes herself male will enter the domain of heaven, period, 
end of the Gospel of Thomas. Ladies, I have good news for you. (laughs) This is the most popular alternate canon book that the skeptics throw out there. You see why I'm excited to show you this garbage? (laughs) Um, Then there is, it it gets weirder. (laughs) Then there is the infancy gospel of Thomas, written around the same time, about 150. The infancy gospel of Thomas claims to have been written by Thomas the Israelite. But the author is clearly not Jewish, not even familiar with Judaism. Not even familiar, it doesn't even understand Judaism. That's for sure as you read through the infancy gospel of Thomas. The infancy gospel is called that because it's about the, the young years of Jesus. That's what it's about. Um, in it, um, a five-year-old Jesus, five-year-old, makes 12 sparrows out of clay on the Sabbath. And he also s- gathers water together and purifies water. He purifies, so he's got sparrows, he's got water, and the Jewish leaders show up and they rebuke Jesus for doing this on the Sabbath. They're like, what are you doing? This is wrong. So he sends the birds off, he claps his hands, and he sends the birds away and he says to the birds, remember me. This story made it into the Quran. Muhammad, it seems, who was the author of the Quran, or at least most of it, most likely, um, he was more familiar, I think, with the Gnostic Gospels than he was with the actual Gospels. This is why he misunderstands the Trinity in the Quran. He thinks Mary's part of the Trinity. Um, and he has things like this. So this story is in the Quran. Then another boy comes up and he takes a read and he does something to drain. He doesn't describe how, but he drains the water that Jesus collected, this purified water. Let me read to you what happens next. Jesus says this, or it says this rather. Uh, Jesus saw what had happened and became angry because he drained the purified water, saying, you irreverent fool. This is five-year-old Jesus, by the way. Remember that. (laughs) You irreverent fool. What harm did the pond of water do to you? From this moment, you too will dry up like a tree and you'll never produce leaves or root or bear fruit. In an instant, the boy had completely withered away. And as you read the context, he died. This, he dried up like, and dead. Just like that. That's right. Later, let me read to you again. This is quoting now from the infancy gospel of Thomas. Later, he was going through the village again when a boy ran by and bumped him on the shoulder. <laughs> Jesus got angry and said to him, you won't continue your journey And all of a sudden, he fell down dead. Then the parents of this boy, they come to Joseph and they complain. And here's what they say. They say to Joseph, because you have such a boy, you cannot live with us in our village or else teach him to bless and not curse. He's killing our children. Whoa. Whoa. What is, what is this thing? I don't even know what religious perspective these people had who wrote this thing or what they were trying to promote. Maybe they were just trying to shame Christ or something, or maybe they just were trying to sell a book or maybe make a name for themselves. Who knows? But Jesus responds to these people complaining to Joseph by making them blind. So, boom, he makes them all blind. And remember, he's five. He's five here. And then it says this. I'll read to you again from the gospel, uh, the infancy gospel of Thomas. When Joseph saw that Jesus had done such a thing, he got angry and grabbed his ear and pulled very hard. Joseph, I would not do that if I were you. The boy became infuriated with him and replied, It's one thing for you to seek and not find. It's quite another for you to act this unwisely. Do you not know that I don't belong to you? Don't make me upset. Then, as you continue reading through this infancy gospel, Jesus continues to terrorize people who are trying to teach him the Greek alphabet. They're trying to teach him the Greek alphabet, and he's like, I know more than you do. Tell me what the letter A means. And then he gives him this weird poem about the letter A, and he's like, slanted and crooked and slightwise and this, and it has angles and dancing. And and he says all this weird stuff about the letter A, alpha, the the Greek letter alpha. 
And then the teacher's like, oh, what am I going to do? You're, I've been defeated by a child. It's, it's just really, I'm not kidding. It's this really weird, confusing thing. <laughs> so he's terrorizing these people who are trying to teach him the Greek alphabet. Then finally, the, towns, uh, the townspeople are upset. The teachers are upset. Joseph's upset. He takes Jesus into the house, gives him to Mary, and he says this. this here's your quotable spot from the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, 14.5. Chapter 14, verse 5. It says this. Joseph says to Mary, don't let him go outside because those who annoy him end up dead. <laughs> this is the Jesus who said, suffer the little children to come unto me. <laughs> You're like, no kidding, suffer the little children. No. Then, it, then the very last story in the infancy gospel of Thomas is the, is the story from Luke about Jesus when he was 12 years old, or it's an adapted version of it. They slightly changed it. This probably to give credibility to the infancy gospel because now, oh, now you're saying something that really is in the Bible and so it makes you feel like it's more legit. Um, it's just a deception thing. Obviously, not really qualifying for canon status here. You know, we looked at the scriptures that are in the canon. Today we're looking at the ones that aren't and, and um, that some people pretend in, their, in all honesty, in their blind unbelief. I, I, I don't say this to be bigoted, but like how do you read this and think it belongs? in the Bible. Like there are people who think that this belongs. There are people who think the Gospel of Thomas we read earlier should be taken and replaced John and should go into the canon of scripture. Women, you must become men. Like nuts. It's just there's a blindness that's there. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to pretend and act like we're all, all of our, tr every truth is equally valid. Come on. That's silly. Um, then we have the Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of Mary is a third century work. Mary was up in age when she wrote this. Or <laughs> um, the Gospel of Mary, right? So right, right in the in the 200s. Now this is about an eight-minute read. It's very short. We don't have the whole thing either, and that's part of the reason why it's very short. It's very very quick to read it. Um, let me read to you some passages from the Gospel of Mary. Then Mary stood up and greeted them all. By the way, this is, um, the Mary, we're not sure, is probably supposed to be Mary Magdalene that, that it's talking about, we're talking about here. This is um, some of the inspiration, I think, for Dan Brown um, and his uh, Da Vinci Code. Then Mary stood up, greeted them all, and said to her brethren, do not weep and do not grieve, nor be irresolute, for his grace will be entirely with you and will protect you. But rather, let us praise his greatness, for he has prepared us and made us into men. There you go. <laughs> That's confirmation right there. When Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good, and they began to discuss the words of the Savior. Peter said to Mary, Peter says to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of women. Of, of woman. I think it should be women there. Tell us the words of the Savior, which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. Now, that's the, that's the foundation of this, is that Mary supposedly was the secret disciple. This is Dan Brown stuff, the Da Vinci Code, right? This is, Mary was the secret disciple who had secret knowledge that the disciples didn't have. Now, this obviously is not the case, but that's the, that's the, the fabrication for the, to build the case for this book. Um, so, uh, Mary answered and said, What is hidden from you, I will proclaim to you. And she began to speak to them these words, I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision. And then she, she begins to talk about these things. And she's talking about what Jesus basically told her, secret information. This is Gnosticism. It's all about secrecy and secret info and the secret stuff. And, you know, like you ask a Gnostic to tell you about their beliefs and they're like, can I really, can I tell you, like, do you have the spark of divine in you? Can I tell you? Whereas Christians are like, we'll tell everybody, you know, <laughs> like handing out tracts and stuff. Well, here's some more stuff, more quotes, as she continues on. When the, This is supposed to be a words from Jesus. When the soul had brought the third power to naught, it went upward and saw the fourth power. So it's a, it's a story where there's a soul who travels and it meets four different powers and defeats them one at a time. It's like a video game. It had seven forms. This fourth power is the last one. Let me read it to you. It had seven forms. The first form is darkness. The second is desire. The third is ignorance. Yes. The fourth is zeal for death. The fifth is the realm of the flesh. The sixth is the foolish wisdom of the flesh. The seventh is the wisdom of the wrathful person. These are the seven powers of wrath. 
They interrogated the soul. These powers, right? Where are you coming from, human killer? And where are you going, space conqueror? Yeah. I'm reading it. That's what it says. The soul replied, saying, What binds me has, has been slain, and what surrounds me has been destroyed. Probably talking about a human body, because again, they hate, they hate the flesh. Uh, the, but not, not, the, not the sinful flesh, just flesh. <laughs> like, like carne asada, like nothing's good. Um, and my desire has been brought to an end, and ignorance has died. In a world, I was set loose from a world, and in a type from a type which is above, and from the chain of forgetfulness which exists in time. From this hour on, for the time of the due season of the ion, I will receive rest in silence. After Mary had said these things, she was silent, since it was up to this point that the Savior had spoken to her. Aum. Clearly not the words of Jesus, clearly not Christianity, clearly somebody profaning the name of Christ, profaning the name of Mary, profaning the name of everybody that they write about to proclaim what are intended to be nonsensical statements because that's the idea is only, only us Gnostics can explain these things to you. I mean, you can study it all day long, you're never going to understand it because it doesn't actually make sense. Um, clearly this is Gnosticism. Now, this, again, is the sort of thing that Dan Brown, in the Da Vinci Code, he gets his inspiration from this stuff. It's, it's just an attack on Christianity. Let's just peel the layer away and look. This is what it is. Then we have the Gospel of Peter. As you can guess. I mean, do you think Peter wrote this one? What do you guys think? <laughs> no, um, this was a mid-2nd century text originating in Syria. Originating in Syria. It was popular for a time. And it focuses on, which doesn't mean it was good, okay? Joel Osteen's books are popular. It focuses on the death and resurrection of Jesus. It says, so that, that's the beginning, the death and then in, towards the resurrection. That's the, whole, that's the whole message. It says that Jesus, among other things, felt no pain on the cross. That was why he didn't cry out. Now, this is like a distortion of the, of the actual scriptural idea. The scriptural idea is he didn't cry out in defense of his own self while he was in court. As a lamb before his shears was silent, he opened out his mouth. It was in defense of himself before Pilate, before uh, Herod, and before the high priest. He did not defend himself. Uh, but on the cross, we, he cried out. We know specifically he cried out. We don't know if he just screamed in pain. He very possibly did. But this statement is he felt no pain on the cross, so he didn't say anything. So they're hammering him, and he's like... Is that all you got? I mean, like, I don't know what it is. Um, so there's some really fanciful stuff in the Gospel of Peter. I think it's very interesting. I'm going to read to you a little bit of it. And it shows you this. It shows you what it looks like when people add myth to the Bible. Because for years and years, there were these German theologians, you know, 200 years ago, and they proclaimed that everything in the New Testament was myth that was added when it was about resurrection or anything that was miraculous was a myth that was later added, but the original story didn't have that. And it was mythologized. And this was based on theories that the Bible, the books were all written 100, 200 years later. After, but now we know for a fact that's not the case. We proved this wrong. But this is what it really looks like when there's myth. But during the night before the Lord's day dawned, as the soldiers were keeping guard two by two in every watch, there came a great sound in the sky. So this is after the death leading to the resurrection. That's the moment. They hear a great sound, and they saw the heavens opened, and two men descended, uh, descend shining with a great light, and they drew near the tomb. So the soldiers are witnessing these things. The stone which had been set on the door rolled away by itself and moved to one side, and the tomb was open, and both of the young men went in. Now when these soldiers saw that, they woke up the centurion and the elders, for they were also there keeping watch. See, in this gospel, the, the elders, leaders of Israel are also there. So you have centurions, you have elders, you've got a large group of people at the tomb. While they were yet telling them the things which they'd seen, they saw three men come out of the tomb. Listen to the description of these people. Two of them sustaining the other. So Jesus is seen here as, as like being carried sort of by these two that messengers, although, as though he, he rose, but he's kind of weak, you know, he's got to recharge. Okay. <laughs> um, but we don't see that in the scriptures. It was just, it wasn't like that. Um, and a cross following after them. 
So two guys, three guys come out of the tomb, and what comes out next? A cross on its own. Interesting stuff. It gets more interesting. The heads of the two they saw had heads that reached up to the heaven. So their heads are in the clouds. These are big dudes. Like, as they came out of the tomb, they were like, do, 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 do. Like, they ate some mushrooms, and they got really big. But the head of him that was led by them went beyond heaven. How do you even know who it is? <laughs> like, like, it just keeps going and going. And I'm, I'm sure it was his whole body that was supposed to be big, not just his head, hopefully. Um, and then, as I, I'll read on, it says, and they heard a voice out of heaven, out of the heavens saying, and this is the trippiest part, this voice from heaven says, have you preached unto them that sleep? The, the answer that was heard from the cross was, yes. So there's giant Jesus, giant angels, weak Jesus, a, a, a moving, walking, and talking cross. This is what it looks like when you add myth to what has happened in the scriptures. This isn't what the scriptures look like, is it? Even the miracles that are recorded in the scriptures, they're just seen as like, this is just what happened. It's just an, an account of this is what happened. It's not this weird, you know, stuff. Like, I, I wouldn't know how to defend the Bible if it looked like this. All right. There's more. There's, I could do a lot more, actually, but I'll just do a little bit more. The Proto-Evangelion of James. This is, the pro, it just means basically the infancy gospel of James. So another infancy gospel. This is about a 30-minute read. It claims uh, to have been written uh, by James in Jerusalem about the time of Herod's death, which would be, there's several Herods. So Herod's death, which Herod? Well, the last Herod died in 92. And so that would be the latest option for this time, but actually it was written about 150 AD. So again, it's another forgery from about the same time period as these other ones were creeping up as Christianity was getting popular. It was, it was, a, it was, it was a, a normal thing, apparently, for people to attack Christianity back then. Surprise, surprise. It's really not about Jesus. This uh, Proto-Evangelion is about Mary more than anything. And this is some interesting stuff. Mary's dad is named. Mary, the mother of Jesus. His name is Wahim. And his mother, her mother's named, and her name is Anna, or Anna. And they're barren. They can't have children. Wahim then goes out and fasts, and he declares, I am going to fast until God gives me a child or an answer, until he gives us an answer. I'm not going to eat until God answers me, which is always a bad idea. Like, fast, yeah, but don't, like, be like, God answer, or I'll kill myself. This is not smart. Anna, then she's, while he's off in the desert doing this fasting and praying, she's praying and she has the poor me prayer where she's like, poor me and says something and poor me and says something and poor me and says something. It's a good inspirational prayer. And then Anna's pregnant. Wahim comes back from the desert to find that she's already pregnant. That's right. Mary was born of a virgin or of a Probably not a virgin as much, but she was immaculately conceived. Put it that way. In this text, she was immaculately conceived. Huh, interesting. At six months old, we re it's recorded that Mary walks seven steps at six months old. And then at that point, something, a shift happens in life. She's walking, she walks seven steps, and her mom's like, no, you know what? I'm not going to let her touch unholy ground. So she turns her bedroom into a sanctuary, whatever that means. That's what it says. And Mary, from then on, only eats special pure food. From then on in her life, she only eats pure food. At three years old, she's then taken to the temple where, where God, according to the text, showers grace on her and she dances. And her parents leave her there at the temple. And she's then taken care of by the priests. After that, she stays at the temple. She's like, she's, she's holy, you know, is the idea. She stays at the temple. But at 12 years old, they have a dilemma. A dilemma comes up because at 12 years old, as she's hitting puberty, now they're like, there's uncleanness issues. If you know, familiar with the Jewish law, right? So then they're like, what do we do? What do we do? So they're worried that she'll defile the temple. And so she's given in marriage through miraculous revelation 
to Joseph using something with staffs and things like that. There's like a revelation that Joseph's the guy. Now, Joseph, at this point, he's introduced, he's already an old man with sons and a previous marriage. And he's a widow. Interesting. <laughs> um, then you get the birth of Jesus. I'll, I'll kind of summarize some of these things at the end, but this is just this is just the storyline, right? Then the birth of Jesus comes. Now, at the birth of Jesus, Joseph is going out and he's looking for someone to help them with the birth and he can't find anybody. And then there's this really interesting like Star Trek type scene where he's walking and then time freezes and it gets into details. And it's like how like this, the how the birds like weren't moving and these different animals weren't moving and nothing was moving and he's looking and nothing's moving. And then he's shown who can help them. It's a really interesting thing. Then, as they're running in there to help, Joseph gets in there and he comes in and sees as she's in labor to give birth. This is Mary, right? She's in labor. There's a light that surrounds the room and poof, the baby has arrived. Now, I will not get into detail because it's, it's graphic. It's graphic in the text. But they, they later check to see, did in fact the baby come this way, in which case her virginity is intact, and they check. They have somebody come and check. And then they say, yep, still a virgin even after the birth. Then it ends with some info from Luke, which is actually from the Gospel of Luke, which is again thrown in there probably just to validate it, make it feel like it's more, uh, more Christian. This also is, is, we see the influence of this text, the Proto-Evangelion of James, in the Quran as well. Muhammad seemed more familiar with these than he did with the actual Bible. But the Catholic Church um, has, they didn't used to believe this. And they didn't believe this for a long, long, long time. But eventually they made it dogma. Like you, you officially must believe this if you are a Catholic. You have to believe this in the perpetual virginity of Mary. And this is the, this is the beginning of that. This is the beginning of that. That Mary was, was always a virgin before, during, after. At every point in time she maintained that virginity. And we see that that comes here from a, from a spurious text that was, written, that was forged and written in that way. And that's, that's unfortunate. But that's the actual history uh, the reality of it. Then we have the Gospel of Judas. Now you may have heard about the Gospel of Judas. This will be the last one I do tonight. Um, the Gospel of Judas was recently in the spotlight, big time, um, because there was some stuff printed of it. It just kind of popped up. I'm, I, you know, it's just the way things are. Um, there's always news outlets that are ready to produce anything that attacks the Bible and ignore anything that supports it. And <laughs> I'm not saying you know it's a conspiracy. It's just the way things are. <laughs> it's just how it. But uh, I like to quote Bart Ehrman, who is probably the most Bible unfriendly guy on earth at the moment. Um, he just writes book after book attacking the scriptures from different angles and different directions. But he gives us lots of good defenses to the Bible because as you, as you look at what he says and then you prepare your stuff, you find that you've got this really good support for scripture. But he says about the Gospel of Judas, in case you hear about this, that it was written by Judas? No. This is Bart Ehrman. He says it was not written by Judas and there is no scholar on the planet Earth, who thinks it was? He, does, he says it was not written by any eyewitnesses or any sort of associate of the apostles. He says it's as old as um, about 170, 180 AD. So it's not as old as the Gospels in the New Testament. It doesn't compare to them. And it is not, according to Bart Ehrman, not a historically accurate account. Now, when there's areas where I don't have to argue with Bart Ehrman, that says something. This is our modern... 21st century, like, champion of atheism, agnosticism, paganism even. They love this guy because, Islam, because he just attacks the Bible and then they get to use his stuff. They quote his stuff a lot. We'll look more into his stuff uh, later when we get into some other issues. Um, also, Bart admits that this is a Gnostic work. And the, in this text, in the Gospel of Judas, it says that the world that we live in was made by two angels whose names are rebel and fool. Rebel and fool. And it was fool who was quoted in this Gospel of Judas as saying, let us make man in our image. So again, you see Gnosticism is a direct attack on Christianity. That's what it is. It's, it, it's, it's a sick assault. Anyway, it, it just goes on and on. But the, the main idea of the Gospel of Judas, what really catches people's eyes, and this is why it got, it got a lot of publicity and a lot of mileage in the media, 
is because Judas here is seen as a good guy, a good guy who's delivering Jesus from his body at Jesus' own request. And he's told they're all going to hate you for it, but you've done better than all of them and you're really helping me. And so remember the body's bad, so Jesus wants to get rid of this thing. And Judas helps him out by betraying him. There you go. There are more and more and more. Um, there's the Acts of John, not written by John. It records things like the idea that Jesus is walking with one of the disciples. John says that I, I often would walk with him and we walk on the sand and I'd look back to see his footprints and they weren't there. So it's like the footprints in the sand thing, except the reason why they're not there isn't because he's carrying you. It's because he doesn't really have a body. It's just an illusion. That's the Acts of John. Then there's the Acts of Paul, and it recounts a tale where Paul the Apostle is facing down a lion, and he's in the Ephesian amphitheater, and he's facing this lion down. But Paul, he reminds the lion that he baptized it. <laughs> Paul's like, hey, didn't I baptize you? <laughs> and then, but the text is very careful to assure us that the lion had a, had a confession of faith before this baptism took place. Then, Paul jumps on the back of the lion, and they escape out of the amphitheater. <laughs> Can I just conclude? <laughs> Christians have nothing to worry about in the lost books, the banned books, the secret gospels, and other misnomers that were given. Why were these books kept out of the Bible? Because they're ridiculous. For the same reason that, like, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is not in the Bible. It's, it's for someone to have to ask why they're not in the Bible. They're either ignorant of the book, ignorant of the Bible, or they're playing a game, which is more often the case, I think. Why are they promoted? None of these are apostolic. None are first century. None are orthodox Christianity. They're clearly not. Why are they promoted? It's an unscholarly, scholarlish attack on the Bible. <laughs> Um, and this is why I think, and if I could just encourage you guys, we need more Christian scholars. We need more believers out there who actually spend some time studying this stuff and preparing and researching just because then we can dispel the lies. Because the one thing that the world can get on us is saying, I know a little more about this issue than you do. And then they're able to distort the information. Um, and so it's really healthy for us uh, to, to have these guys. I love, I love getting into contact and connect with people who've done so much homework on these issues. Um, and so I really appreciate a lot of the guys, the sort of unsung heroes that are Christian scholars that are out there doing a lot of the legwork that allows us to then benefit and get blessings from that. So, um, yeah, well, let's pray. <laughs> um, Father, we thank you for your, your word that is not ridiculous. Oh, man, what would the atheists do with these books if they were part of the Bible? Ugh. Um, Lord, we're just so grateful for your holy word and that, that it's, it's just what happened. It's not myth, mythological embellishments. It's just what happened and that we can trust your word and um, that this just serves to remind us that oftentimes those things that cause us doubt, those things that attack our faith are really shadows and whispers and in, innuendos and insinuating, insinuating things that are not really quite the way they look, making mountains out of molehills. And so we pray you give us wisdom and discernment. Help, help us carry this information into the world to show people the goodness of your word because we want them to know Christ. We want them to be saved. We want them to know the grace of Jesus. And we want to see your believers strengthened and built up. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -mm. I don't think it sounds good to them at all. I think it's an embarrassing thing to them. And they're not happy about it. But I think what it shows us shows us is the sort of infancy of what ended up becoming that that was a, a non a non biblical doctrine that found its way in that found its way in and became popular and eventually became became dogma. There are legit people out there who think there's there's great spiritual truth. I don't know how many Gnostics there are, but they do have, like I said, there was a big Gnostic church in LA and they tend to gather together and try to like sort of incorporate all religions and act like they're the, they're the, so if you see someone who's like, I believe in all religions, we gather together and we actually hear from different, different, it, then there's a possibility that that's a Gnostic group. Um, 
it's not very big in my mind. I mean, LA, you know, is LA, so I don't, know. I don't want to say too much. But um, but you can find stuff online. Like there's a Gnostic library, like a website where you can actually get this stuff. But I, but I mean, how much does a website tell you about the real presence of something that I don't know? Oh, um, I think that they started meeting in the 80s, if I remember right, the Jesus Seminar. And they met over a period of years. I don't know when they published that book, The Five Gospels. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know when they published it, but you could Google it probably. Just put The Five Gospels and maybe type Jesus Seminar. I'm sure it's still available probably. So um, you can see why I was, I was excited to get into this stuff. Because I feel like it completely just, it's like, you, you know, you ever see Lord of the Rings and like Sam... Gam Samwise Gamgee, he's, he's climbing up this tower and he's grunting and groaning really loud and his shadow is on the wall and it makes him look like this ogre, like this giant creature and the, the orcs are seeing him coming and they're like, oh, there's this, he's like, arr, 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 and there's this like giant thing coming and then they see him and they're like, oh, pah. and they, because he's a little hobbit, he's a halfling, you know, he still beats him up though, but this is different. <laughs> um, I feel like this is what happens with, with, with doubts. We get hit with this, the shadow of the thing. And then as, as it comes into full light, you realize, oh, this is, this is not what they made it look like. And that's the case with a lot of these things. Now, with this information, next time you have a chance and you see the History Channel, BBC, one of these guys do these things, you'll be like, oh my goodness, they didn't just say that. You just, you just did what? You're quoting the proto-evangelion of James <laughs> as if it gives us real information about Mary? Like, are you serious? I mean, it'll, you can be like me. Look up um, the History Channel's Banned from the Bible, um, or look up the, 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 the documentary Lost Books of the Bible, uh, and you will see the Jesus Seminar, although they won't say Jesus Seminar, but you'll see Robert Funk, Bart Ehrman was part of the Jesus Seminar. And they mix it with scripture as though they're all on the same level, as though they're all presenting a, a fair version of Christianity. <coughs> the History Channel did a thing about the many faces of Jesus not long ago. And there's still a lot of web information on it. And they were like, they would present it as though, as though um, uh, the Gospel of Thomas presented a whole different Jesus that was somehow equally valid as what we read about in our New Testament. And yet it's a later book written by unorthodox non-Christians um, to promote their own ideals and, and put their lies in the mouth of Jesus. Like, why would we quote this as anything? Yeah. But they, yeah, they do. All the time. All the time. While I was dead, you sought me out.